I think that one of the things about welcome is that it can be an encouragement, it can be an exhortation, but it can also be threatening. And 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 believe me when I tell you that I don't want this to be threatening. I want this to be an open. I want this to be an open door. I'm never sure when this thing is on. I think I'm going to start now. Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad so many of you have found us. Um, this is the first welcome of 2022. We're here in the middle of the month, and I got to tell you, I am so excited to be able to be with you all here today as we embark upon the journey that is 2022, strengthening both our relational ethics practice right alongside the reason why we have a relational ethics practice, and that is an unshakable commitment to racial justice. Let me introduce myself to you right quick. I'm Lace Watkins. I am the executive director of the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity right here in Southern California. And the reason that I am here is to not just give you a welcome, but to invite you to walk with me on this journey, this incredible journey in 2022. Insofar as this is a welcome, this is also a refresher for more seasoned community members. We want to get everybody, absolutely everybody here off on the right foot. We don't want to be your resolution. And I know that a lot of you have come to us in the last months, and I'd like to thank you for being here. And for those of you who have just shown up this past January as part of a resolution to do better in the areas to become closer to the person you say you want to be, I am excited and I affirm your choice. But I have to do this with a caveat, with a caveat. I don't want to be your resolution. I want to be a person that invites and encourages you to make racial justice not just a resolution, something that you tick off on your brand new calendar. I have one too. So I have a couple of notebooks and my new 2022 planner and lists. I have so many lists of things that I want to do in 2022. And I I think that they are great things to want to do in 2022. But I have to remind myself, just like I'm reminding you, that this is about more than just, just checking off a box. Let's face it, most resolutions fail. We wind up doing what we say that we want to do, being who we say what we want to be for one or two or three months or weeks or days. I am no different. I have a gym membership that could be used a lot more. I have a walking app on my phone that could be used a lot more. I have snacks in my car that are not as healthy as I would like. Yes, I go and make the good promises and the good resolutions, but they do wind up breaking down, or they can. That is what I want to guard myself against and what I want you to encourage to guard against too. If all of my healthy living resolutions are just something to check off, how many vegetables did I eat? How many minutes did I walk? Um, how many moments was I um, at the weight training things at the Joan Croc Center? Are they machines? Are they apparatuses? I don't know. But anyway, they make you go like this and then you get better shoulders. <laughs> That's great. But if all this is for me, is to say that I did it, I'm not going to make very much progress. And it's true for you here too. I need to make healthy living something that is a part of me in service to something larger. Going on with the entire get lacy healthy in 2022, just by myself, just for the reasons of I'll look better in jeans and maybe I'll lose a little bit of this chin, that is not enough. What I wind up doing is framing it in a slightly different way. And the way that I frame it is there's a lot that I want to do. 
and I need to be alive and healthy and strong in order to do it. I am as physically strong as I am mentally strong and vice versa. I want to encourage you to do that too. Yeah, we are going to be, if you stay with us and you stick with this, putting you through your paces, much like my physical therapist does with me every week. Four minutes on the bicycle and then those things where I look like I'm doing a golf swing with a kettlebell and then this thing where I basically suspend myself and do 20 reps and then planks and then core work, all of this. But one of the things that Chris does, and he let me know what he was doing, is that the exercises that Chris gives me are for a purpose. You are not going to get Chris to agree that the only reason for me to do exercising and getting my heart and my lungs in better shape, making sure that I have stamina and balance, ah, stamina and balance, is so that I can look better and so that I can wear high heels again. (laughs) I fell about four years ago, and, and one of my goals that Chris kind of went, but one of my goals was to be able to wear high heels, uh, not sky high. That that will never happen anymore for me. But, you know, two inches, block heel, right? And so he said, if that's what you need, that's what you need. But But let me tell you why I give you the exercises that I do. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to listen. Here is why he gave me those exercises. I do the kettlebell thing that makes it look like a golf swing so that I can hoist 30 pound bags of dog feed. He has me doing squats and planks so that I can do squats easily and be able to do gardening, to be able to do work around the property. He has me do lifts so that I can lift things up to high shelves. I live alone. And so if I am going to, as they say, age in place, which sounds horrible, but let's face it, I'm almost 60. And if I stay alone, I'm going to be taking care of this property by myself for a very long time, knock wood, and making sure that I have the stability, the balance, the stamina, the heart and the lungs to be able to do this work is important to Chris. Now, if I can wind up wearing that fake leather skirt that I bought five years ago that has never closed all the way, so much the better. But that's not why I do the work that I do every Tuesday. There has been incremental progress. As much as there could have been in the last four years? Nope. I love Del Taco entirely too much. But I'm way farther along than I was. This time four years ago, I was on a cane. I'll tell you, I'll say that again. This time four years ago, I was walking with a cane. I don't anymore, but I could go back. That is why it has to be something more than a resolution. And that's why I want you to be able to get off on the right foot. I am very lucky to have Dr. Chris as my physical therapist, who has been nothing but kind and encouraging and yet tough and unyielding. He has a vision of me riding my bicycle from my house to the office three miles away and being able to do that up and down hills with stamina and with confidence. So I'm going to ask you, insofar as as you allow me to, I would like to be your Chris. I would like to be able to put you through your paces, but for a very specific goal. I want you to learn relational ethics, but not just for the sake of learning it so that you know all the jargon and you can use it when necessary and sometimes even weaponizing it. I want you to learn relational ethics and service to our North Star, and I am contractually obligated to say the North Star, and I am happy to do that. Lessening and mitigating the harm endured by black and brown people, perpetuated by white people and white supremacy. Chris reads me. He watches me. And he has actually used that as leverage. How are you mitigating harm if you can't get out of bed? How are you mitigating harm when you've got a stomach ache because you ate foods that weren't the healthiest for you? 
How are you mitigating harm when you drive past the Joan Crock gem instead of going in and doing what you know you need to do? I want to be your Chris. I want to get you off on the right foot. I want you not having to go, what do I do next? But to learn a routine, like the routine that Chris has given me, we call it praxis or practice so that it becomes so internalized and so that you are not just willing to, but eager to embark on a journey. I got to tell you, even, even, even as I talk about, I don't go to the Joan Croc Center as much as I, as I should. I love it when I'm there. I love going to the gym and Kearney Mesa with Chris and all the other physical therapists and, and, and therapy assistants. I love it there. I love it when they give me thumbs up. I love it when Chris says, I think you can handle six pounds instead of the four pounds we've been using. I think you're ready for this. Let's go. There, there, there's this gym that, that, that the super fit people use. And sometimes I go in there and do some of the work. Um, and I feel like such a badass when I'm in there. <laughs> Those are where the free weights are and, and lots and lots of mirrors and, 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 all these hard bodies who are so kind to me when I go in, I want to be Chris for you. Yes, we are learning things that you may not have learned before. And I am going to test your muscles. I'm going to test your core. But it's going to be worth it. Instead of lifting pans of dog food, I want you to be able to have conversations, hard conversations, crucial conversations with savvy and love at the core. Instead of squatting and bending, squatting and bending so that you can do gardening, I want you to be able to learn how to have emotional regulation so that you are not blowing up, shutting down or running away. So that you're learning these practices, some might even call them virtues. That will, if you allow them to, absolutely positively impact the rest of your life. There is a reason that I play with a kettleball once a week. And there's a reason why I'm going to exhort you to come here regularly as well. There are so many points of entry, so many to Lay Sunrise. We have what we call the takeout window, where you're probably looking at me right now. That is our Facebook page, and we are so glad to have you here. This is where um, you get to learn your footing. You get to learn what the community looks like. You get to learn a little bit more about me. You get to see whether or not I'm a woman worth listening to, whether or not I'm a leader worth following. And if you decide that, then we have what we call the Lace on Race Cafe at the website where we go deeper, where there is a dedicated group of people who have already said yes, who are all willing to walk with you in very deep ways. And when you are ready, when you are ready for hardcore mentorship and being able to serve even as you are served, we have what we call chef's table. That is our magnum opus. I love each and every one of you. Each and every one of you who stops in, whether it be for two minutes, 20 minutes, or two hours, whether it be once a week or twice a day, I love you all. I love you all. This year, however, I am going to commit to not only loving all 10,000 of you, and that's an easy thing to do, but also to put the focus on the people who have already said yes. In the bistro, in the cafe, in chef's table. This is where the work is. I think of the 10,000 of you in the takeout window as the, as the people in the stands in the Coliseum. Some of you are, are kind of skeptical. What is this about? Some of you are excited, are excited. You've got your popcorn and you've got, you've got your, your, your drink and you're watching and it's, and it's great. Some of you are, are, are waiting for me to fall, waiting for the lions to come into the Coliseum and see me eaten alive. We'll talk about that later in another video. But what I actually want you to do is I want you to put down your popcorn or actually don't waste food. Eat the popcorn. Eat the popcorn. 
but I want you eventually to put the empty popcorn bag down, slurp your last sip of your drink, and come down into the, into the Colosseum, come down into the field with me, with us. That's where the work is done. There are 10,000 of you on all platforms. And I know that a lot of you feel that you can get, well, you know, I can get what she, what she has to give me. I'll just stay back here. I'll stay a lurker. I'll stay a follower on her personal page because I know she cross posts. I will stay her friend, but you know, she already talks to me all the time. Why do I need lace on race? Y'all know who you are. But I'm here to tell you that that by itself is not enough. The only way you are going to get what I hope you get out of Lace on Race for the purpose of the North Star is if you come into the scrum. And I will keep on exhorting you and exhorting you and exhorting you to do that. I've already mentioned the North Star. And people say, what? what? Why do you need a North Star? Why do you need a mission statement? Why is this so important? Well, every word is important and we'll go into it month by month throughout this whole year. Lessening and mitigating the harm endured by black and brown people perpetuated by white people and white supremacy. I gotta tell you, when we first started Lace on Race, it was a shorter sentence. It was lessening and mitigating the harm endured by black and brown people. Later on, I added by white people and later on still to make sure that no one is off the hook and white supremacy. To answer a question that is leveled at me frequently, do you hate white people? Oh my goodness, no. I hate white supremacy and I hope you do too. We are going to be threading a very fine needle as we walk together, hating white supremacy, but not necessarily hating white supremacists, hating racism, but not hating racists. Because if we hate racists and white supremacists, we hate every single person in America. We are all part of a racist soup. We were born into it. We grew up in it. You did. I did. That makes you, by definition, a racist. And guess what? It makes me a racist too. So if you're coming here so that you can learn how not to be a racist anymore, that my darling, is a fool's errand. I can walk with you and if you allow me to show you tactics and strategies and ways of living and being that will make you anti-racist. That does mean that you are going to have to confront scripts and schemas and everything you've learned in your life. And that includes people who think they've got it all down. One of the things that I, that I hope that you do is that you are willing to be able to come at this with curiosity and even a bit of skepticism, but not a hostile adversarial skepticism. I want you to bring your critical thinking faculties. I want you to bring your thinking caps. I want you to be ready to ask questions and ready to really truly hear the answers and to be willing to consider answers that you have not heard before. Here at Lace on Race, we are new people doing new things in new ways. I'm going to say that again because it's just so important. We are new people doing new things in new ways. And doing change work for the last 35 years and very dedicated to racial justice work for the last half decade or so, almost to the exclusion of everything else, but not to the exclusion, total exclusion of everything else, I had to unlearn a lot of things that I thought that I knew. This has been a learning journey for me as well. And what I want to be able to do is take everything in here and pour and pour and pour. Let's talk about the internal for a moment. But not before we talk about the North Star again. I really want you to internalize North Star values. 
So we do ask that you really take a look at it, not just so that you can memorize it like a Bible verse like you might have done in catechism class um, when you were 10 years old, but I want you to really inculcate it. I want to lessen and mitigate the harm endured by black and brown people, perpetuated by white people and white supremacy. I want to do it when I'm brushing my teeth. I want to do it when I'm driving to the center. I want to do it when I'm getting groceries at Valley Farm Market. I want to do it when I'm having coffee in Ocean Beach. I want to do it when I'm finding new sneakers so that I can walk 20 minutes a day. And I want to do it so much that it is muscle memory. That lessening and mitigating the harm is muscle memory memory. It is so internalized and so inculcated in me that there is no way that I can go to Valley Farms and get sweet potato casserole and bananas without a focus of lessening and mitigating harm. That is why we are convinced that the work of racial justice is an inside job. Let's clear up some misconceptions. There are some people who think that lace on race concentrates on navel gazing <laughs> to the exclusion of doing good work outside. Oh, no, 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 no. I want you to take it outside. I want you to do the work of racial justice. I want you to do it well. I want you to do it reliably, and I want you to do it for the long haul. That is why we have the methodology that we have. That is why we present the material to you in the way that we do. In 35 years of change work and as an addiction and substance abuse and codependency counselor and, na and as a faith-based person and also in grassroots and electoral politics, I have learned the way that people do change work. And there's a lot of things that I have incorporated into Lace on Race. There have been some wonderful practices. There have also been some funky ones. Part of it is the idea that if you have not begun the change work that needs to happen, if you are not doing change work simultaneously with outside action work, outside action work is due to fail. If not today, then later. One of the things that we talk about a lot is the fact that we are asking a lot of the same questions that we were asking in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, that we were asking in 1963, the March on Washington. That was 10 days after I was born, by the way, that we're still asking the same questions um, starting from 1969, 1971, the Black Power Movement, the same questions that we were asking in 1991 after the beating in Los Angeles that we were asking in 2020 during the Black Spring. I contend and I will say it all day every day that we should be a lot farther along than we are. And in order to do that, we need to look at the ways that racial justice has been, quite frankly, sold. Some of it has stuck, some of it has been best practice, and I'm all here for it. Some of it has not been, and we need to be able to tell the truth about that and then look at best practices. To use an example in my work as an addiction counselor, I first um, started doing addiction studies in my early 20s, so that was the mid-80s, over 30 years ago. If I were to come with you with the same concepts and techniques and methodologies from 1985 and bring it into 2022, huh, that would not be effective. The field has changed so much and I need to be willing to come up with it. You would never hear me talk about harm reduction in 1985, but you hear me talk about it now. That's a big deal. It's the same with change work. Things that were considered radical cutting edge in the late 50s and early 60s are vilified now and actually with good reason. It is not enough to lean on the laurels of what you learned 40 years ago or 20 years ago or even 10 or 5 years ago. Society has changed. The landscape has changed. 
The new focus that I want to be able to do is to have an internal focus so that you can approach new material and new environments with curiosity and with savvy and with Hesed at the core. Hesed is a very muscular kind of love that usually has not been talked about as much as it could be within change work. We want to change. We don't necessarily have to love you, but but we want to we want to change the landscape. Well, here's the thing: people don't change unless they're loved, and and crucially, unless they're loved well. And that is what we are here for. Applied relational ethics, which we talk about a lot, is in my view the way to go. It gives you stamina and curiosity and resilience and relentless reliability. It allows you to personalize where you need to personalize, to put the focus into you in a self-reflective but not self-absorbed way. And it allows you to depersonalize where you need to depersonalize. Not everything is about you. When we're talking about the aggregate, when we're talking about systems and institutions, it's easy to say, well, I don't do that. I've never done that. Yeah, well, aggregate trumps anecdote, and you probably do it more than you think you do. So all of these things, an internal focus so that you can have effective outside applied praxis is why we are here. Kind of like I said earlier, <laughs> racial justice is not a gig for spectators. Here at Lace on Race, we will both encourage and expect you to be an active community member, not a spectator in the stands. In fact, I should see no one in the stands. I want everybody on the field in the scrum engaging with me, with my staff and with my leadership team and with your fellow walkers. Here's the thing, here's the thing. Coming into this in a spirit of curiosity and humility and an acknowledgement that you don't know what you don't know is crucial. And also that perhaps what you do know may be either misguided or, or outdated or just downright wrong. To be able to come and be willing to be changed. Let, let, let's confront that for a moment. There are a lot of people who say, that lace. She wants to change people. She wants to change me. Guess what? They're not wrong. I do. I do. I think that unless we change, that the work that we do outside is going to be at best short-lived and at worst impotent. So, I hope I have you this long, and if I do, let's talk about what you can do to be able to jumpstart your practice, jumpstart your praxis, and engage fully in Lace on Race. Well, the first thing is to read and internalize the guidelines. I wrote them. I like them. They are not only a way of, of making sure and ensuring that we are a safe-ish space. We'll talk about that later. But it is also, if you allow it to be, a metaphor on how to move in the world as well. No humiliation. No shaming. Say what you mean. Answer the questions that you're asked. And by the way, learn how to ask better questions. Nobody is irredeemable. Everybody can talk to everybody as long as it's done with good praxis, what we call the winning strategies. Speaking out with love and savvy is one of them. Cherishing is another one. Giving whatever you can. This is talking about being the heart of a servant. And this is what hopefully you are going to be more and more willing to do. Not servitude, service, not humiliation, but humility. So let's talk about safety. 
Let's talk about safety because a lot of people come in and one of the things that they really want is they, they want to know, is this a safe place? Is this a safe place for me? Will I be safe here? Well, not necessarily. We are a safe-ish space. We do our best to provide a container that makes it safe to talk about unsafe topics like housing discrimination, like colorism, like the economic forces that guide white supremacy and racism. And yes, we do feel that racism and white supremacy are primarily economic constructs. In order to do that, yeah, we need a safe container, but it's not in the way that you might think, yes, we want to keep you safe-ish, but we also want you to learn how to be a safe person yourself. We're going to talk about boundaries in 2022, boundaries that everybody has. Sometimes they're paper thin, sometimes they are 10 foot lead walls, but there are two types of boundaries that we want to be able to talk about, learn deeply, and then apply. The first one is what we call protective boundaries, and that's what everybody uses. I am drawing a boundary around myself. I am setting a boundary. That's what keeps the outside from affecting you. But there's also what's called containment boundaries, and that's what we're going to learn, how to keep yourself safe for other people. It's everything that I talk about when I talk about my mask on approach. It's important that you not spew. There's a video that I did about mask on during the beginning of COVID and that we're going to rerun. And I think it's a good one. In so far as you want to keep yourself safe, you need to also be safe for others. It's a fallacy that the mask is only for you. <laughs> when I wear a mask to Valley Farms supermarket or to Kaiser to pick up my prescriptions or to my house of worship or even to my parents' house who are in their 80s and immunocompromised. I am not doing it for me. I am not doing this to keep myself safe from the lady in the produce department or from Bobby and Hubert, my parents. I'm doing it to make sure that they are safe, that I am giving them my absolute best. And one of the absolute best things that I can give them is not killing them. In our case, we mean not necessarily physically, like in COVID, although yeah, but emotionally and psychologically, we want to make sure that we are not leaving people in worse shape. We do it by using various things. I already talked about um, the, the, the winning strategies, um, connection, um, speaking out, love, and savvy, learning the circle of connection, disconnection, repair, reconciliation, coming back to connection. There's another ish that we talk about. It's free ish. It is imperative to me, and it was a guiding value when I founded Lace on Race almost exactly four years ago that everybody, everybody can learn this stuff, which means we are not behind a paywall, which means you do not have to get this wonderful booklet for $35 and then we'll give you a code and you can get it. No, everybody's in. But that also means that everybody also has to tell the truth about whether or not they are willing to ensure that this space continues free-ish that you financially engage with us so that we can reach as many people as possible. Most of the consulting work and one-on-one -on -one work that I do is pro bono. The reason I can make it pro bono is the Robin Hood model, which is what we're talking about here. We're going to talk, and I've talked a lot, and I will continue to talk a lot about money, particularly money as it concerns the racial justice space and the relationship, the fraught relationship between what are a lot of the times white donors and people of color, producers, creators, thinkers, writers. And we're also going to talk to people of color because we need to be supporting ourselves as well. Insofar as I want to exhort white people to fund what they say they believe in, we need to do the same thing too. 
And I'll say it over and over again, if not lace on race, then who? If you are not going to support lace on race, I can't, I, I can't compel you to. And even if I could, I wouldn't. But if you are saying that you are committed to a racial justice ethic, you've got to be supporting someone. You've got to have tangible skin in the game. And we're going to talk about that. And how are we going to talk about it? With kind candor and with hesed. We're going to talk about more of these terms later on, but kind candor is exactly that. You can say anything you want to anyone you want in this space. There are no silent partners here. Everyone speaks to everyone, eye to eye, but you do it with love at the core, what we call hesed. It is a tough, muscular, what I say, um, a Mr. T and stone cold Steve Austin kind of love. It's a love that's not afraid to tell the hard truth, but it is not said in a spirit of humiliation. It is not said in a spirit of contempt. Something else that people have, have talked about is, are you, you have, you have so many rules and also you are just, what if people disagree with you? Are we expected to swallow your entire fish whole? <laughs> well, at least at the beginning. Yeah, there are some things that I do expect you to have under your belt. And if you don't have it under your belt, I want you to get it under your belt. That racism is real, that it's that it's not just something that someone makes up, that it's in the here and now, and that it's not something that happened 130 years ago, and then slavery ended and everything is fine now. That racism exists in workplaces, in the medical community, in the educational community, in the justice system. that racism does indeed harm black and brown people in untold ways, not least of which is the trauma that is part of being in the soup of racism and white supremacy that hates you. Yes, yeah, you're expected to believe these things. And if you don't believe them fully, to be able to at least have the curiosity and the resilience to be able to allow some of it in. Let's go back to boundaries for a minute. The, the, the paper thin walls versus the 10 foot lead walls. 10 foot lead walls are not going to be particularly helpful for you here. There's another kind of illustration that people use, that of louvers, where you can close the louvers, but then you can open them a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more so that healthy things can come in. You're going to have to make room for some new information, and that's going to mean deeply challenging attitudes and what you thought you know you knew for a long time. Again, new people doing new things in new ways. Facebook, which is our primary mode of communicating with you, is something that we are doing our best to move away from for a few reasons. Facebook actively suppresses us. I will say it all the time. We can't even run ads because Facebook thinks that we are too incendiary. Not because I use curse words, I do, but not a lot. Not because I hate people, I don't. For a long time, I was beating myself up because I thought Facebook was suppressing us because the message wasn't effective and the message wasn't trenchant and the message wasn't meaningful or relevant. Actually, I think that Facebook suppresses us because we are none of those things because we are relevant, because we are needed, because we are trenchant. It's one of the things we're going to talk about, the ambivalence of people to really, really inculcate social justice in general and racial justice in particular. And one way to do that is to suppress. Facebook is not going to help you. We are not going to, even if you press like and subscribe, and I hope you do, we're not going to pop up in your feed very much. You have to have the discipline, the discipline to come to this space every day, to go to the website every day. And you have to stick with it. We're going to rerun the Vox article again and again. The Vox article was from a year and a half ago, and it says some really important things, and we're breaking it down in there. But, but one of the things that I talked about was the idea of reliability and being able to go the distance. I am 60 years old. Racism is not going to end in my lifetime. And if you are 
50 or 30 or 20, it's not going to end in your lifetime either. It will get better if we do the work to get it better, to make it better. I was born in a segregated hospital in South Central Arkansas in 1963. The other day, when I got my prescriptions, I was behind a cornucopia of people. It was amazing. And, and sometimes I'm gobsmacked at the, at the progress that has been made in the last 58 years, but it is not enough and we cannot rest. We cannot rest. And finally, I want to talk to you about the Western Star. The Western Star is the sustainability and the longevity of the Laysan Ray Center for Racial Equity, who we believe is changing the landscape, not just the conversation, but the landscape of racial justice in general. This is where I get to have one-on-one -on -one and abidings. This is where I get to talk to groups, large groups and small groups. Have laptop, will travel. But we need to be able to do it. Like I said earlier, most of the work I do is pro bono. We don't charge. In fact, <laughs> we give away money. But the only way that we can do new things in new ways is through you. We have a small budget um, of $10,000 a month. That sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. And when you consider what we have done in this time, in the short time that we have been in existence, we are considered one of the best spaces for racial justice in the country. I say that with definitely not arrogance, but yeah, with a certain amount of pride. I do feel that we are changing the landscape for the better. I do think that we are encouraging people to ask better questions. And in fact, I've seen and read some of my ideas being said. Have they necessarily been attributed to me? Not always, but that's okay. That's okay. One of my mentors years ago said, you know, one of the best ways to change the world is not to care whether or not you get a byline. That's a big deal. I don't care if anyone ever knows my name, but I do care that people know my work and I do care that I leave a legacy. And it's because of people like you that I'm able to do that. Really quick, as I'm, this is longer than I thought it would be. What's upcoming? The Good Place. We're going to be looking at applied relational ethics through the lens of the NBC television series, The Good Place. It is on Netflix now, and I am preparing the first three episodes for you. The Dimes and Envelope Challenge, because we do need to learn how to give reflexively from the heart, from the marrow, eye to eye. We're going to be reopening Lace on Faith, where faith of all stripes or no stripes, agnostics and atheists are welcome, because... One of the things that I am convinced on in my own practice is that it's bigger than me. Anti-racism is bigger than me, bigger than my limited imagination, bigger than my limited skills, bigger than my limited vocabulary. It's bigger than me. And we need to be able to figure it out. America, even though we don't like to talk about it, is founded on some religious principles. And if we are going to look at that, Regardless of how we feel about the religious principles themselves, we need to have a good starting place. And for those of us who do have a faith walk of whatever stripe, or even just, not just, or even an ethical and moral practice, we need to be able to tie it in and pivot hard to race. And that's what Lace, Lace on Faith is going to do. We're also going to be talking about Lace on the Race. It's 2022 midterm elections. And a lot is at stake. Lace on Race does not take partisan positions. But we can look at things through the lens of applied racial justice, and we can say whether or not a given proposition or a given politician or a given legislation is either closer to or further away from North Star values. We're going to be doing Lace on Race Ask Me Anything, and let me tell you, I'm so excited about doing those, where basically you can ask me anything. And I'll answer. I'm so excited about that. That is going to be a precursor to Lace on Race Lives. As the country opens up, um, it is going to be my privilege to be able to go to different cities and to abide with each of you. And something fun, because I love doing it. I'm going to call it Lace on Her Face.
get ready with me where sometimes while I'm getting ready to do videos, I'll do a video while I'm getting ready and we'll talk about things and we'll tie it in to race and ethical praxis. You need preparation to do your nails. You need to know what you really look like in order to contour effectively. To be able to talk about these things in a fun way is something I really look forward to doing because believe me when I tell you that racial justice work is important. Racial justice work is serious, but racial justice work can also be fun. I giggle every day with my staff, with my leadership team, with people that I abide with one-on-one, -on -one, with people that I see in, in the market. Living a life that you're proud of. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for sticking with me for as long as you have. Thank you for this, this, this opportunity to give you an introduction, a deep introduction as to who we are at Lace on Race. If you have any questions or comments, put them below, whether or not you're on YouTube, Facebook, on the website, um, in the Lace on Race Cafe, on Twitter, on Facebook. And if you like what you are listening to, make sure that you are pounding on that subscribe button, pounding on the like button so that you can get more content from us. But this is not the only way I want to talk to you. I want to see your faces. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to walk with you in ways that mean something in the long haul. I say this all the time. I love you and I am so grateful that I'm able to do this work and I am thankful that you all allow me to do it. Talk to you soon.